So welcome to today's webinar on disordered eating and GI screening assessment and interventions with Beth Rosen. I'm Jocelyn, our registered dietitian here at Kiwi Biosciences, the company behind FODzyme, where we make digestive enzymes that target FODMAPs. I'll turn it over to Claire, our co-host from NERVA, who will introduce um, herself and Beth. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, my name is Claire. I am the research lead at Mindset Health, uh, the company behind NERVA. Um, NERVA is a gut-directed hypnotherapy mobile app for IBS patients. Um, I am really honored to be able to introduce Beth, uh, Beth Rosen, for this amazing webinar that she's doing. Um, Beth is a weight-inclusive registered dietitian specializing in GI nutrition and disordered eating. She has been working in the field of nutrition for over 27 years and has a virtual private practice. Beth helps clients find relief from digestive disorders um, such as IBS, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, gastroparesis, celiac, and reflux. Uh, Beth is also the chairperson of the Dietitians in Gluten and Gastrointestinal Diseases uh, subgroup of Dietitians in Medical Nutrition Therapy Dietetics Practice Group of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, she is also the Director of Nutrition and Dietary Services for GI On Demand, providing uh, integrative GI virtual care and support to patients. And that barely scratches the surface. Uh, Beth is wonderful, and I'm very excited to introduce her and to let her take over for, for this webinar. Thank you so much. That was so kind of you to introduce me. Hi, everyone. Um, this is a webinar on disordered eating and GI screening assessment and interventions. We're going to scratch the surface today. There's so much to talk about, um, but we'll start here. Here are my disclosures. And the agenda for today, uh, we'll start with an overview of disordered eating and eating disorders, um, the diagnoses, as well as the difference between the two terms, and talk about tools for and techniques for um, assessing eating disorders. And I'll give you some examples of some interventions for treating eating disorders when you've identified patients with eating disorders via two case studies. So I'm um, hoping we have lots of time for that. So let's look at the difference between normal eating, disordered eating, and eating disorders. Now, a major characteristic of normal eating is that eating fluctuates and should not result in nutrient deficiencies or weight changes that don't come back to homeostasis or balance in the absence of an illness or a life issue. And a person with normal eating should be able to eat enough to get adequate nutrients and calories to meet the needs of their body and their lifestyle, um, feel good or neutral about food without categorizing food as good or bad or healthy or junk or any other diet words that may come up, um, be able to eat intuitively, which means to listen to their body's cues for hunger and fullness, but also eat for pleasure and feed their souls in addition to feeding their bodies. Um, and they should spend very little time, maybe 20% or less, thinking about food uh, or um, focusing on meal planning. And so it shouldn't dominate the day. Disordered eating is characterized by holding beliefs and attitudes towards food that lead to guilt um, and or anxiety. And they spend a lot of time thinking about food and meal planning, bargaining with diet rules, um, having concerns about their size and their shape, or cha the changing of their size, depending on what their food choices are. And it's important to note that when many in society have similar unsubstantiated beliefs about food, normalization of disordered eating can be deemed normal even though it's disordered. So for example, a widely held belief in the US is that carbs are bad, and I put those in quotes for those that can't see me, um, but as healthcare providers and trained dietitians, we know that our bodies and our microbes need carbohydrates to thrive and provide us with nutrients and prebiotics and even enjoyment of food. So that's an example of a disordered eating pattern that's been normalized by society. Uh, this group does spend most of their day thinking about food and meal planning um, and worrying about the consequences of those. So eating disorders, by definition, are diagnosable psychiatric illnesses marked by ongoing disordered eating behaviors and thoughts and beliefs that impact 
not only emotional and physical um, health, but also psychological health. Quality of life is definitely impacted. And there's usually a lot of black or white thinking with very little room for shades of gray. Uh, eating, eating disorders are diagnosed by mental health providers. And they use something called the um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, known as DSM-5, it's the fifth edition. Uh, and it's not uncommon for those diagnosed with eating disorders to have other psychological co-occurrences, um, things like anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder. And for some, there's also a genetic component. So here are some facts and statistics about eating disorders. Again, I'm based in the US, so that's where this data comes from. But the US isn't the only country where eating disorders are prevalent. You'll find them in any country where there's a society that um, reveres thinness or considers thinness to be healthy and where bias exists towards fat bodies. Uh, the first fact here shows that there's a discrepancy between who experiences eating disorders and disordered eating and who gets diagnosed. So although one in 10 folks are diagnosed with an eating disorder, up to 50% of Americans have some form of disordered eating. And uh, eating disorders are really dangerous. They are the second leading cause of death um, from mental illness um, that can be caused by mental uh, complication from the um, eating disorder or by suicide. Uh, the first cause of death is opioid use disorder in this country. Uh, and it's also really expensive to get treatment. So um, the average cost is $80,000 and very few insurance companies, panel providers, uh, or cover, cover what's needed for people to really heal um, and get into recovery. And uh, in this country, there are only 10% of people who can receive treatment. There are actually only 5,000 beds available in residential treatment. There are different levels of treatment, um, residential being the second highest, first is um, inpatient and then residential, and then they step down to what's called partial hospitalization program, which is um, uh, most of the day, but not someplace where you live, and then to, intensive outpatient, which is a couple of times a week, a few hours, and, that, and that's done you know, also either in a center or um, virtual, but just part of the day. And then the last would be outpatient, which is the work I do with folks who have eating disorders. Um, what you'll see here is that one person um, every 52 minutes dies from an eating disorder. So you can see that this is something that we need to uh, make sure that we're taking better care of these folks so that this doesn't happen. And this last one shows that up to 98% of folks with eating disorders will develop functional GI disorders. And I'll show you that possible mechanism in a minute. But I just wanna show you a few more facts and statistics. This is what eating disorders may look like when working with clients in the GI population. Um, eating disorder prevalence is up to 24% in general GI practices. So if you work with GI patients, you are working with people with eating disorders. I'm gonna repeat that a lot. Uh, I think it's important for us to understand that um, in most cases, the um, eating disorder comes first, but there are some cases where GI disturbances can fuel the disordered eating, um, as is the case a lot in, um, inflammatory bowel diseases, where we see a prevalence of about 10% of folks with ARFID, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Uh, and I'll explain more, get more in detail about that in a few minutes. Um, but the reduced intake can impact motility and fuel a cycle of disordered eating when people are worried that um, food is causing symptoms and so they take in less food. The pathology of the connection between DGBIs and eating disorders are only partially understood. But if we were to start, start at the top left-hand corner, um, we can see this potential cycle where eating disorder behaviors impact the GI tract. And those include things like vomiting or laxative abuse or even restrictive intake. And then malnour malnutrition can occur in eating disorders and that leads to electrolyte imbalance and metabolic myopathy. And then the gastric motility, intestinal transit time, and gastric emptying can be impaired from that. 
And so what can happen is that food can just sit in the gut and not move fast enough. And the, that can produce signals of gastric distension and um, fullness. And that can create a perception of this fullness that may not exist. So this person can become malnourished because they're not actually getting enough to feed themselves. And then finally here, changes can occur in the microbiome and provoke GI symptoms as well as the ability to regulate hunger and fullness. So a lot of people, when they fall into disordered eating and eating disorders, lose those cues for hunger and fullness. And then the cycle can start again. So we don't know a ton about the connection here, but what we do know is that functional changes along the gut-brain axis are worsened by the changes to the microbiome and from undernutrition. And impaired GI motility appears to be secondary to malnutrition from muscle wasting, from um, the lack of neurotransmitters. So for the most part, we tend to see um, GI conditions in folks with um, anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. So I'll share that also in a minute. Um, but folks with ARFID tend to have a lower rate of GI co-occurrences. So typically ARFID may come first before the GI um, for some folks. And the reason why um, ARFID has a lower rate of co-occurrences is because there's no body image aspect to it. Um, so actually, um, ARFID is, um, it's this different beast that exists with GI, um, and it's believed to be due to this, this lack of focus on um, body image or a need to be thin. Okay, so we're going to take a poll, and the question is, what percent of people with eating disorders are considered underweight by BMI standards? So let's see what you have to say. Jocelyn is a, oh, okay. I see people are popping up. You're not allowed to Google. <laughs> I see in the comments, a lot of people know the answer to this. So yes, uh, the answer is A, only 6% of folks with eating disorders are considered underweight by BMI standards. So what that means is that 94% of people um, remain above that cutoff. So what the takeaway here is, is that you can't tell an eating disorder by the body that contains it, which is why we need to screen everybody. Okay, so let's talk about types of eating disorders. Uh, and we'll go over just the most common ones. Really, this is like a, a, um, a refresher course if, you, if you've had these before, but um, just to touch on the different ones that you might see in GI. Okay, so anorexia nervosa is this first one. And it's probably the eating disorder you think most about when people talk about eating disorders. And it's characterized by an extreme focus on weight loss, control over food, and body dysmorphia, which is a belief that your body looks different than it does. And the behaviors lead to malnutrition and starvation. And currently, the severity of the eating disorder is based on um, BMI. Um, the DSM-5 has been around for a while, and they use BMI as a measurement of low body weight. Um, but recently, the American Medical Association acknowledged that there's an inaccuracy and a racial history to the tool. So I'm hoping that in the next iteration of the DSM that they remove that. Um, because another classification of anorexia is atypical anorexia, which has the same characteristics as anorexia without the low BMI. So since 6% of people have the low BMI, most people with anorexia fall into the atypical anorexia um, space. And there are two subtypes of anorexia. There's the restriction type um, and the binge purge type. And the binge purge type is that during the past three months, um, the patient would have engaged in recurrent episodes of purging and, or binging and purging. Um, and that looks like self-induced vomiting, misuse of laxatives, um, the misuse of diuretics or or enemas. Um, and this condition is very common to have coexisting uh, psychiatric uh, 
conditions. Bulimia nervosa is the next one. And this one is characterized by a preoccupation with weight and size, um, but restriction is followed by binging and purging. Um, and uh, I you know, wanna note that um, the DSM-5 is limited and does not um, categorize everybody neatly into a category when they're diagnosed with an eating disorder. So atypical anorexia with binge purge looks a lot like bulimia nervosa. Um, again, inappropriate compensatory behaviors are taken um, up in order to avoid weight gain. Um, excessive exercise is one of them as well as well as fasting, which I didn't mention before. And um, I think it's important to also acknowledge that when people binge, I know it's a common term a lot of people will use um, and just in, in normal conversation, but a binge looks like um, eating more than would normally be eaten in two hours, feeling a lack of control, usually feeling sick after, and big feelings of guilt and shame after eating uh, and, um, and eating in secret. Those are some of the common uh, things there. So um, that is bulimia. The next one is binge eating disorder. And binge eating disorder has the binging component um, without compensatory behaviors as a means of, to a purge. So binge eating disorder is the most common um, type of eating disorder and it's more common than anorexia and bulimia combined. And these folks can experience weight gain or fluctuate, fluctuations in their weight. Um, and they can have an element of restriction too or not. Uh, and lots of times folks who have a uh, binge eating disorder um, have uh, either a trauma or they have uh, a history of trauma um, or a history of chronic dieting or both. Okay, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, AKA ARFID, is the only eating disorder that we know of without a focus on body size and shape. And it can be characterized as a lack of interest in food or fear of food as we see with people with IBD. Um, the fear can also stem from consequences of eating. So a fear of choking or having experienced this before. So things like choking, nausea, vomiting, or an allergic reaction to food can also bring it on. Um, but it can also be brought on by food poisoning or a GI issue. And uh, it can result in malnourishment and impact the quality of life and social functioning. Now that we have a basic idea of the most common eating disorders uh, that we'll see in our patients, let's look at how we might identify them. Again, we don't diagnose as dietitians or um, healthcare professionals that aren't in the mental health space, but if we suspect that there's an eating disorder or disordered eating, we can refer um, to mental health professionals for diagnosing and counseling. So during an assessment, these are some things to look out and about, look out for and ask about. Um, well, BMI, of course, is one of those things. Uh, I'm not big on using that as a tool, but one of the things the DSM-5 does is consider um, the severity of anorexia based on the BMI. So a BMI between 15 and 17% would be considered um, a severe form of it. But this is, again, only seen in a small population. And I can't stress enough that we need to look past body size and see what else is going on with the people. Um, we might see fluctuations in weight, like a progressive loss or an inability to gain weight back after a loss. It's important also to look at uh, menstrual status for those with a uterus and of age to menstruate to see if it's irregular or if there's a menorrhea. Of course, bowel habits. I think we all ask about bowel habits, but what we see in anorexia quite often is severe bloating and long-term constipation. Of course, we can ask about eating patterns and food rules and what, what diets are followed or if there are food groups or foods that are eliminated or avoided. Um, if you have a good relationship with a patient, you might be able to delve further and ask questions about things like body checking. And body checking is looking in a mirror or pinching parts of the body, um, measuring with a measuring tape or weighing multiple times a day. It's, it's, um, it's something that fuels that 
eating disorder voice in the head to keep on the um, the disordered behaviors. And of course, body dis- sat- body dis- satisfaction um, dominates thinking. So you may hear comments or, or where they put their bodies down. And the preoccupation with weight and shape is pervasive. So they may mention parts of their body they don't like or that things are too big. Uh, and self-esteem is strongly influenced by weight, shape, and control over food in this group. Uh, and what you might also see is a co-occurring past or present psychiatric diagnosis. Um, in my practice, I see a lot of general anxiety disorder. I see a lot of OCD, a lot of ADHD. You might see that too. Um, and um, for the very thin folks who don't have a lot of body fat, they may have cold intolerance. So it may be, you know, a summer like we're having here where it's, uh, you know, the world's on fire and they're wearing sweatshirts because they're cold. So um, you might see that in some folks. Um, and also brittle hair and nails, you may notice a thinning of hair from broken nails. That's something you might notice by looking at somebody. Um, and one last thing to mention would be sleep issues. Uh, people can have trouble sleeping when their brain is not well fed. So that's another thing that um, you can look for when you when you talk with them. So BMI is here again, but I think more than that, we can look at um, their bowel habits, if they're using laxatives, what their relationship is with food, their relationship with exercise, questions about exercise can, can be, you know, do you exercise, how often do you exercise? Do you take rest days? Um, do you exercise when you're ill? Those kinds of things. There's usually a very um, strict rule around exercise and it's done quite often. Uh, on, on appearance, you might notice swollen glands or um, what some people refer to as chipmunk cheeks. So swollen salivary glands or dental issues from um, purging. Um, and they may share that they have you know, thoughts about their weight and shape. Uh, it's important also to note that not everyone will have every characteristic, but knowing what they are might be able to cue you into some of the maladaptive behaviors that you see. So many people with binge eating disorder, um, as I said before, also restrict. And as a result of the restriction, they binge. And like people with anorexia and bulimia, they will also have body image issues. But besides body image concerns, um, people with binge eating disorder can use binge eating um, as a coping mechanism for past trauma. Um, so while body image will certainly still play a role, it might also be a coping mechanism for something not related to the body. Uh, you know, when you have these conversations, they should not be participating in compensatory behaviors because that's the differential for bulimia. And they may have lots of guilt related to food and food rules or um, a history, a long history of chronic dieting. And then with ARFID, um, you want to make sure that they're, they don't have a, a poor relationship with their body or their actions aren't related to their body size because that's the di- differential between um, ARFID and anorexia. Um, and there is a fear, but not, it's not necessarily how the body would change according to food, but maybe what might happen to the body if, food, if that food is taken in. Again, it could be you know, the vomiting. It could be a fear of an allergic reaction or some GI issue. Um, and, you know, this can be brought on by history of trauma. It can be brought on by food poisoning, all of those things. Uh, for those who are on the autism spectrum disorder, this is also a common eating disorder. And it, their issue is usually related to the texture or smell or taste or even temperature of the food itself or a lack of interest in eating. So you're going to see this, uh, you know, across GI, but also with folks on the autism spectrum. So if you see that in your practice, you may see ARFID more commonly. There are also some tools you can use for assessment um, to really uh, know for sure whether or not someone has an eating disorder. And the most common tool you use is a version of the eating disorder examination. Um, This first one, the EDE, is an interview that is done by a clinician that focuses on four subcategories that include restraint, which is, um, restraint is having a food rule, but possibly breaking it. So saying um, donuts are bad, and I'm using quotes again, and then you eat the donuts and then you feel badly about the donuts. Um, So that's restraint where you still have the rule, uh, but you're not 
um, restricting, so you ate it. Uh, also, a concern about um, eating and shape concern and weight concerns. And the eating disorder examination questionnaire or the EDEQ is a self reported version of the EDE that's an interview that's done by a clinician. Um, there's 28 questions on there and there's a scale for scoring. Lots of times it's self-administered but done with a clinician around so that they're available to answer questions. Um, there are links here to them, but if you Google them, they're free to use. This next tool is the Eating Attitudes Test or EAT26. And this tool doesn't assess for eating disorder. You can't get a diagnosis out of this, but what it does assess for is an eating disorder risk. And um, it's an appropriate tool to be used in healthcare settings, but also at fitness clubs or in schools or even with sports teams. And it's intended for adults and adolescents and again, self-administered um, and available free online. And it could really cue you into some maladaptive eating behaviors if you were trying to capture that data um, from everyone who walked into your office or onto your screen. This next tool is called the Eating Pathology Symptoms Inventory. And this one can, this is called SB, and it can generate an eating diagnosis based on the DSM-5. And one thing I probably should be real clear on is that none of the tools I've mentioned so far are validated for people with co-occurring GI issues. So while this is a great tool and could potentially, potentially diagnose somebody, uh, one, we're, that's not our job. Um, but two, um, if somebody has an eating disorder and a GI disorder, then there really is not many, there aren't many tools available to us. There's one, and I'll share that with you. Um, but this one has eight subscales and, um, and goes through a lot of the different behaviors that people with eating disorders um, experience. The SCOF questionnaire is a quick five question tool that was developed in the UK, um, but only screens for anorexia and bulimia. And the acronym is meant to help you remember the questions. So SCOF is, do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? Um, the C is, do you worry that you have lost control over how much you eat? The O is the UK part, which is, have you recently lost more than one stone, which is 14 pounds or 6.35 kilograms in a three month period? Um, the first F is, do, do you believe yourself fat when others say you're too thin? And the last F is, would you say food dominates your life? Um, this is also readily available if you Google it um, to be used. I think it's a limiting tool. Um, but it's still a tool nonetheless. So if you have nothing else and you remember the scoff questions, you can ask them. This is our newest diagnostic tool and one that's used specifically for RFID, but should be used along um, another tool to rule out other eating disorders because it doesn't in its process rule out the other ones. And um, it has three subscales that focus on picky eating and appetite and fear. And uh, again, this is something we commonly see in IBD. Um, and for them, they have some dietary behaviors that become altered either because they avoid food triggers or they're worried about inflammation and trying to control it, um, not usually based on a weight concern. This is the one tool we have that is validated for GI issues, but it's only used for people with celiac disease. And this is the Celiac Disease Food Attitudes Behavior Scale or CDFAB. And it's an 11 item, um, that 11 item uh, questionnaire that assesses attitudes and behaviors towards food. So it's, it's not um, a full diagnostic tool, but it lets you know whether or not there are thoughts and behaviors and attitudes towards food that are are disordered. And then there are some tools that are not um, necessarily diagnosing or assessing risk, but a tool like this, which is the Satter Eating Competence 
inventory. Um, this one um, is a validated tool from Ellen Satter and it focuses on four subscores. And it really talks about competence versus um, maladaptive eating behaviors. So this is one that I actually use in my practice and anyone who walks to my door gets screened. And I have yet to find a big handful of folks who um, don't have maladaptive eating because most of the people I see either have GI issues, eating disorders or both. Um, but I find it to be an interesting tool to use. And if a tool feels clumsy, then you can have a conversation with your patients and be curious about their relationship with food and their body and compensatory behaviors. And as of 2015, the prevalence of disordered eating and eating disorders in patients with GI disease is high, um, ranging between 5.3% and 44.4%. And this can make it difficult to treat a GI condition when there's a coexisting eating disorder. So if you take one thing away from today, it should be this, which is always treat the eating disorder first before making any dietary changes to the GI disorder. So there are ways to treat an eating disorder um, without exacerbating the, GI, the eating disorder symptoms. Um, treating someone with an eating disorder is truly a life or death situation and needs urgent support. Um, there are still some things we can do without changing their diet. So let's look at those. There are so many tools, and these are just a few, um, but these can be used concurrently with eating disorders. This is not an exhaustive list, just a couple that I had come up with. Um, the first category is cognitive therapies, and under there is cognitive behavioral therapy, and you can refer out to a mental health professional that knows how to do this. There's also gut-directed hypnotherapy, and you can refer out or you can use the NERVA app, which has really good data to show that um, it improves um, functional GI scores. And I've had good um, success with it with my patients. They seem to really like it. It's not hard to use, um, takes about 15 minutes every day. Uh, and, and it does definitely help. And it can help with some of those co-occurrence of the psychiatric disorders where maybe there's some anticipatory anxiety related to um, their GI issues. Behavior changes can be made too. So creating a toileting regimen where maybe they're drinking a warm liquid in the morning and using a stool or a squatty potty um, in the bathroom. Sleep hygiene is important. There's uh, new research that shows that um, the circadian rhythm is impacted by the microbiome and vice versa. So that's something that they can do is make sure they're getting enough sleep. Wearing loose clothing around the abdomen can help folks who have reflux um, or folks with IBS who have really sensitive stomachs um, and, and just make them feel comfortable um, regardless. Smoking cessation, I just put that in everything because I think um, that would help with a lot of things if we didn't have um, cigarettes around, but uh, then you can also include movement. And I have a double asterisk there because for some folks that might not be appropriate because if they're using it as a, comp a compensatory behavior, their therapist um, might recommend that they stop exercise. Um, but for those that are not using it as a compensatory behavior, um, movement can help those with gastroparesis and reflux right after a meal, just sort of help the food move along by moving a little bit. And this last category here is supplements and medications. Certainly prescribed medications by physicians are always helpful. Um, digestive enzymes uh, like lactase and alpha-galactosidase and Fodzyme that includes both of those plus fructan hydrolase, which covers the majority of the FODMAP. So without having to do the diet, um, taking the enzymes with the food has been really helpful for so many of my clients, myself included. Um, Chewable semethicone, which is gas X, can help with gas. Stool softeners for those who are constipated. Uh, enteric coated peppermint oil is an antispasmodic. Uh, laxatives, again, uh, the AGA and the ACG came together and released a guideline recently about how to treat constipation. And one of the things that they recently included was, um, was uh, stimulant laxatives. And those wouldn't be um, 
good to use with folks with eating disorders who have compensatory behaviors of, of purging. So um, certainly using other forms of osmotic laxatives might be helpful, but not the stimulant ones. And last but not least is fiber supplementation, whether that's um, psyllium husk or guar gum, um, if it's for the prebiotics or the bulking of the stool, there's so many things that, um, that we can use. And um, one silver lining to all of this is that in many cases, when the eating disorder is treated, the functional GI issue will resolve more quickly. Uh, so, you know, if we can work not causing more harm um, by not introducing more restriction, then they may be able to go through recovery a little bit quicker, a little bit safer, and feel better with their GI conditions. Okay, so I have um, a couple of case studies to share with you. Um, and these are, these are actual clients of mine. I just changed their names, but the rest of it's the same. So let's start with Jane. Jane is a, uh, was a 22 year old woman. She's now, I think 26, um, with diagnosed with gastroparesis. She was diagnosed with anorexia in high school with periods of extreme restriction. That's what she reported and purging via vomiting, laxatives and exercise. She has a history of reflux since she was 12. She shared with me that she's been a very nervous person her whole life, um, but she was diagnosed with a general anxiety disorder, OCD and ADHD, chronic constipation and low blood sugar um, in the past. And her symptoms included constipation, belching, early satiety, nausea, regurgitation, and a fear of food. And she reported an increased anxiety around eating foods that might trigger constipation or a flare of her uh, GP. And she was diagnosed with the gastroparesis and began limiting her intake to applesauce and soup broth, which was less than a thousand calories per day when we counted it up. And that led to a backslide in her eating disorder recovery or not even recovery, but I think it increased her um, eating disorder behaviors because I don't think she really um, did much work before we started talking about it. But she was open to eating more, but she did worry about gaining quote unquote too much weight. So there was a body image issue there. Um, her meds included Celexa, birth control, Pantoprazole. She was using Ibigard and Gasex and Miralax and she was taking a, um, a probiotic. She was also working with a fitness instructor at the gym who taught her to quote unquote eat clean. And she was on a diet of 140 grams of protein, 60 grams of fiber and avoiding fat and working out six days a week. And she was not currently working with a therapist or a gastroenterologist and her 24 hour food recall from the day before included coffee with Miralax and oat milk, banana, tuna salad, potato chips that she would crunch up into little bits. Sometimes people who have anorexia do something called microbiting. They take little bites or they break up their food. And so potato chips were pulverized. Um, a little bit of chocolate, strawberries, lots of popcorn, another tea with Miralax and meatloaf. Um, she also reported that she eats a whole bag of popcorn when she eats it. And so um, she was currently moving her bowels three times a week and she reported being a number one on the Bristol school chart. So the intervention we started with was to treat the eating disorder before the GI interventions came into play. So I started with something called the rule of threes. And if this is not something you're familiar with, uh, briefly what it is, is a, a guideline for how to choose food and plan during the day. So it's three meals a day, up to three snacks a day, eating at least every three hours, unless you're hungry before, but you know, not going past the three hour mark with at least three components to up to seven components of foods. And you know, if you're a dietitian, you know your components, it's fat, protein, carbohydrate, fruit, vegetable, dairy, and fun foods. And I always include fun foods um, with my clients, eating disorder or not, because I want all foods to fit into their life. So that becomes part of their choices. Uh, she was, um, I asked her to reduce her insoluble fiber intake, um, but only after she would do some what we called uh, curious observation. So she agreed to keep a food and symptom and bowel log. And then if she noticed after eating the popcorn that her symptoms were exacerbated, then she agreed to reduce her popcorn intake and 
add something else instead or in addition to the popcorn. Uh, and she, um, she agreed to that. And um, I decided to meet her where she was. So I would offer challenges along the way. Um, and uh, I referred her to an eating disorder informed therapist and a gastroenterologist. The therapist, um, I, I happen to have a, um, a group that I refer back and forth to because I, I've gotten to know them. When you create a team for someone, you get to know the people in the team. And then when you do have a new client who might not have the proper um, team members, then you can uh, quickly refer. So this is somebody who I knew already. I knew was eating disorder informed and trauma informed. And she was, um, she was referred to this person and they, they worked together for a long time. So I've been seeing this client for over three years. I actually still see her, uh, not as often as I used to, but we, we catch up every month and check in. And this was our first month of follow-ups. Uh, she was able to eat two meals and one snack regularly. And over time, she was able to get to uh, more meals and snacks. She did end up reducing her intake of popcorn because she noticed that she moved her bowels more often and had fewer days with severe gastroparesis symptoms. Uh, she ended up stopping the IB guard because her symptoms were, had dissipated and began working with a the therapist that I recommended. Um, and then we spent some time brainstorming some foods that she would like to include uh, that she thought she might tolerate. And the list she came up with was shredded chicken, nut butter, juice, smoothies, blenderized soups, um, banana bread, crackers, and tzatziki. Um, I never hand out a diet. I, I always ask clients how they like to eat, and then we find foods within there. Um, me knowing what might not hurt with gastroparesis and her knowing what her preferences are, and then that's how we can create a list. I don't share, you can't have this, you shouldn't have this, because if she thinks she can tolerate nut butter, then I'm going to let her eat nut butter. Um, and if she doesn't tolerate it, we'll know from her log and she'll stop. But everybody's so different that I think it's important to make sure um, to have those conversations about food and not just give a handout. She did have a few instances of vomiting that she believed was due to anxiety and the gastroparesis. And upon further discussion, one of the things we found was that she could vomit voluntarily just by contracting her abdominal muscles. So if she was frightened that the food in her stomach was going to lead to symptoms or that the food in her stomach was going to lead to weight gain she purged. Um, so that she ended up realizing very quickly that that wasn't working for her anymore. Um, once she understood the difference between vomiting because it happens from nausea and, and sometimes with gastroparesis and vomiting as purging. Um, she did meet with the gastroenterologist that I recommended and he prescribed her Linzess and Motegrity. And currently, she has she stopped purging soon after our second session. Um, she was retested for delayed gastric emptying a year after we started working together. She really wanted confirmation um, to see if um, if it had gone away. And when she tested, she was at nineteen percent at the end of the four hours, and she was thrilled. So she was um, gastroparesis uh, free at the moment, which was great. Um, she currently eats meals and snacks regularly. She goes out with friends and families without issue. She no longer restricts. She eats from all the food groups. She can actually eat insoluble fiber foods now pretty easily, um, popcorn and salad. Um, she still works with the eating disorder therapist and the gastroenterologist, and she still has her coexisting issues, um, but she doesn't use eating or purging as uh, compensatory behaviors. And she works with her therapist and a psychiatrist for med management. And she's still on the Motegrity. Um, she's tried to come off a few times. It just brings back um, constipation. So she's staying on it. Uh, and that is uh, Jane. So she is in a great place, both in her recovery and with her um, gastroparesis and with her constipation as well. Okay, so this next um, client is Keisha, and she's a relatively new client to me. Um, and it's important to note that she has not vomited since she was seven, but it's a major fear of hers. And now she's 18. Um, she was diagnosed with ARFID at 10. 
Um, and she was also diagnosed at 12 with anxiety and OCD. And her food avoidance started as a result of medical anxiety. She was always afraid to go to the doctor, if she needed a test, if she had to go to the dentist. And she was afraid that she would get sick and vomit. And she did once when she was seven. Um, and the fear started when she was six, but she hasn't vomited since. And um, about a month before we started meeting, she got food poisoning, did not vomit from it. And it increased her medical anxiety. And then she was already scheduled to have her wisdom teeth extracted. And she had such a worry about that, that um, the, her thought was that the food poisoning and the, um, the worry about the wisdom teeth extraction kept the GI symptoms um, persisting. And those included diarrhea, abdominal pain and cramping. Um, and she reported that this led to food restriction. And um, because the symptoms were persisting, she saw a PA at her gastroenterology group uh, who gave her a handout for the low FODMAP diet. Um, she found it confusing, so she scheduled an appointment with me, and she's been avoiding going out with friends for fear of fecal incontinence, which she's never had, um, and her meds include dicyclamine three times a day before meals, which is an antispasmodic, amoxicillin still from the dental surgery, some of her psych meds, and a probiotic. She's not concerned with her weight or shape normally, but she lost 10 pounds due to the food poisoning. So she's worried about her health um, from the loss of weight. And her 24 hour recall includes Ensure, which she adds in when she does have medical fears because she feels like that's a safe food for her. Uh, half a banana. Typically um, she has a turkey sandwich on white bread and cheese and mayo, but this day she had the leftovers from the night before, which was chicken and rice and mushrooms and broccoli and cauliflower. Uh, you can see all those fod maps in there. She had a snack of peanuts and Jello, and Jello she's been having every day for years, um, and cheese its as well. For dinner, she had potato skins with cheddar and bacon bits, and then later on onion dip with potato chips. And she drank some water. Um, she believed that garlic, onion, cauliflower, eggs, and some dairy are trigger symptoms after reading. The handout that she got from the PA, um, but she decided not to eliminate them because she knows herself. And she said that she would never reintroduce them. And she's been working with her current therapist for three years, who she trusts. And she and her mom took an IgG food sensitivity test years ago. So she still avoids many of the foods on that list, um, even though she never had GI symptoms from them. So the intervention we went with, um, if you've watched my recent webinar on the low FODMAP diet, I did highlight um, that the low FODMAP diet is not indicated for people with disordered eating or eating disorders. And there are alternative dietary and non-diet non -diet interventions. Um, so I explained that to her and that we weren't gonna go on a restricted diet and she was thrilled. Um, and then I gave her some education on the use of digestive enzymes um, and uh, on using a prebiotic supplement every day for four weeks. And data shows that intermittent prebiotic fiber supplementation improves microbiome diversity, and it's been shown to be um, very effective. And then I also recommended L-glutamine supplementation for eight weeks um, due to the fact that she had the food poisoning. And at the recent um, Digestive Disease Week in May, Dr. Lin Cheng from UCLA discussed the use of L-glutamine supplementation uh, to improve intestinal permeability that may translate into improved symptoms management. Um, and so I offered this as a treatment because um, it's deemed not harmful and it may actually improve her gut health. So we're going to try it. Um, we worked on increasing her food repertoire, or we'd like to work on increasing her food repertoire and reduce the dependence on Ensure as time goes on and also dispel food myths. So the IgG test, we talked about how that's not an accurate test for um, GI symptoms. We talked about uh, some foods that were on the low FODMAP diet that she enjoys and doesn't feel symptoms from. Um, so we talked about those things. Um, she was also willing to keep a food log that included her symptoms and her feelings, since a lot of this is related to her anxiety, and a bowel habit log. And we discussed the use of gut-directed hypnotherapy, and she was open to it and wanted to talk to her therapist about it. And then 
One of the things that she mentioned was that her quality of life was being impacted because she wasn't getting to spend time with her friends because she worried that she would have fecal incontinence and that's not how she called it, but that's what it is, um, while traveling to see them. So we talked about buying a a camping toilet to keep in her car as a way to just know that it's there. And probably once she knows it's there, that anxiety will go away or lessen. And then um, she would feel free to go see her friends again. So currently um, she is using enzyme supplementation and it's helping. She started both the prebiotic and L-glutamine and is tolerating both. And she's keeping a log and she's able to see that her GI symptoms were correlating more to anticipatory anxiety than to food. And she notes that she did have symptoms when she forgot lactose with ice cream, which that would happen to me too. So I get it. Um, she just, we, she discussed using the um, Nerva app with her therapist and her therapist was all in, uh, but she hadn't started yet. We were really new to working together. And she is going to work this week on increasing her food repertoire, starting with eggs, um, by having them in recipes like uh, baked goods. She likes those um, before trying them as just you know scrambled. Um, so some takeaways for today, if you work with GI patients, then you work with people with eating disorders, please remember that and do your best to screen everyone for maladaptive eating patterns so that we don't cause more harm, treat the eating disorder before treating the GI disorder. And we don't know what we don't know. So if you're not trained in eating disorders and GI refer to somebody who is in the one that you're missing or get training and so that you can treat both. And also what's key is creating um, a collaborative, integrative team for your um, patient. So finding or including their therapist, their pelvic floor physical therapist, their doctor, the dietitian in on um, how you're taking care of, of this person so that they can heal and everybody can be on the same page. And now I will ask, well, if you've got Hi, everyone. Thank you, Beth. That was a fantastic presentation, truly. You were such an ask, ask, ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you for sharing your knowledge with all of us. Um, we do have some great questions. So I'm going to have us start answering this first one from Jessica, who asks, um, for potential trigger foods, what time frame do you give people for l- the lag between eating and the symptoms? Um, good question. Um, anywhere between four hours and 18 hours. So I would say lactose you feel pretty quickly and that's the four hours. Uh, 18 hours for somebody who might have constipation maybe on the short side. Some people might take longer. But remember the food has to get to the large intestine to ferment. So it takes some time to get there and then the fermentation has to occur or the food has to get there or not the food but the molecules have to get there. The, the time, all the, the, the leftover parts, and then the microbiome has to go to work on it, or water has to be drawn into the colon if it's, um, you know, a large molecule like excess fructose. So it takes some time. I, I'd say average four to 18 hours. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, here, our next question. Um, I might actually have clear answer for us. Um, Emily asks, what is the name of the gut-directed hypnotherapy app? What's the cost? Is it appropriate for children, adolescents, and adults? Yep. Um, The gut-directed hypnotherapy app is called Nerva. Um, The cost is $150 for patients, um, $150 US dollars for patients, and that gives them a year's access. Um, And then in terms of it being appropriate for children, it's it's been studied in 18 years old and up, um, so that's what it's most appropriate for. Great. Thank you, Claire. Um, Here we have another one from Deb um, asking, which digestive enzyme and prebiotic supplements do you recommend, Beth? So um, for digestive enzymes, I recommend Fodzyme. I actually do, and I'm the guinea pig, and I use it all the time. Um, And I find that it works. But I will also recommend just generic lactase. Um, for people who have issues with um, with dairy, digesting dairy, um, because Fodzyme can be expensive for some folks and lactase is really cheap. And if it's only dairy, then sometimes I recommend that. And I'll also recommend alpha-galactosidase, which is what's in Beano. 
separate if they're just having, you know, beans and lentils. But again, the, both of those things are in fodzyme, so plus another enzyme, which helps break down fructans, which are in wheat, rye, barley, garlic, and onion. So um, the majority of uh, FODMAPs are covered by, by fodzyme. So that's, that's what I typically recommend. And then for prebiotic supplements, I typically go with um, uh, partially hydrolyzed guar gum as the ingredient. And the three I recommend are um, regular girl. Um, and then Sun Fiber makes Regular Girl, but also uh, Tamar's Nutrition makes Regular Girl, but also has a product called Sun Fiber or Tamar's Nutrition, which is just a, a gender neutral package. The Regular Girl is very pink and girly and not everybody is um, female in my practice. So sometimes we go with gender neutral. And then on Amazon, I found a partially hydrolyzed bar gum called Perfect Pass. And I thought it was funny, so that's why I recommend it. As you can see from my office, I find lots of humor and poop. So um, if it's funny, I'll recommend it. But it, it actually, it has the same ingredients. So that's why I recommend it. Thank you. Fantastic. So much to think about. Um, <laughs> here we have a question from Jean asking, Beth, can you um, tell us what is involved with eating disorder training for dietitians? That's a great question. So unfortunately, uh, you know, if you've been a registered dietitian in the US, you don't get much training on it. Um, so you have to sort of seek out your own. Right now, what exists is um, a, a great um, organization called EDRD Pro. Uh, it's a subscription um, based group where you can watch webinars and get training. Um, it's a great place to start. Uh, I'm going to do a little self-promotion here. Um, I'm part of a group that's founded something called Edgy Training. It's E-D-G-I Training, where um, we've created um, a training program for dietitians that want to learn how to treat eating disorders and GI disorders and the, the co-occurrence of both. Um, and where else can you learn? Um, I would say, you know, finding weight-inclusive eating disorder dietitians who have um, who have uh, specialty in eating disorder. So they ha might have behind their name uh, CEDS, C -E -D -S. Um, it's Certified Eating Disorder Specialist, dash S. So they're able to supervise. If you wanted to go through that process of becoming certified, you'd have to find a supervisor. Um, I believe if you go on the IADEP website, I A I A I A IADEP website. I forgot what it stands for. You can find some of those folks there. Great. Thank you. Uh, that's really helpful to know. Um, great resources out there. Um, we have another question here from Laurel um, saying, can you speak a little more on Motegrity and Linzess? Um, I'm not quite yeah. sure what from angle, but maybe, you know, your experiences on how Yeah, to... they're, they're prescribed medications um, that a physician prescribes. Uh, Motegrity is um, a prokinetic drug that uh, helps with motility. And Linzess is a drug that helps with constipation. I don't know exactly the mechanisms, but that's what they're used for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I'm just looking in our um, comment section as well. We have more appreciation of the, the poo poo humor. Um, and Jessica <laughs> also recommends uh, many dietitians do fellowships with ED specialists as part of their training. Um, so that's one thing to possibly look, look into. Um, we have another question here um, asking, are you familiar with the GI map test? And if so, do you recommend it? I am familiar with it, and I do not recommend it. Uh, I think at some point it's going to be a fabulous tool because it gives information about the microbiome, but we don't have enough information on the microbiome to be able to take that information and put it to work. Um, so for instance, like the, the genome project that happened years ago where all of our genetics are mapped out, if you were to find a gene, you would know what it was for and how it worked. We don't know all that about the microbiome. We might know the um, the microbes themselves, but we don't know how they interact. We don't know if one uses the metabolite of another one. So we're not sure yet of all of that. I think over time, um, that might be a tool that's helpful, or there might be other tools that are helpful, but it's not something that I currently use with my clients. And I think, you know, again, with clients with disordered eating or eating disorders, giving them more information that's not steeped in research um, yet, 
um, can lead to more restriction if they think that they can fix something with food. You can't always fix something with food, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here we have another question starting with, um, do you recommend stool cultures to rule out food poisoning? Um, yeah, sure. I, I don't, um, I don't do them. I'm not a doctor. So I refer to the gastroenterologist and typically I do that a lot. If somebody comes to me without a diagnosis, I want them to rule out all of the, the scary stuff. Um, first, so I want them to rule out anything that's function that's structural before I'll treat it as a functional GI disorder. Um, so yeah, stool cultures are important. Um, I myself um, had C. diff and um, wasn't diagnosed with it because I didn't get a stool test right away until I ended up in the ER. So I think it's important for doctors to order them when patients come in and, and share their experiences. Great, thank you. Um, and then here we have one more on Nerva, um, really around kind of contraindications. So are there any times the Nerva app isn't recommended or isn't safe? Yeah, um, it is contraindicated for any patients with um, psychosis. So um, that would be the, the major contraindication. Um, and then really patients that have severe psychological comorbidities um, are often better, uh, better fit for working with an in-person therapist than um, just app-based care with Nerva. Um, sometimes Nerva can, can go alongside in-person care as well. Um, but really the, the two big ones are patients with psychosis and then um, as well as patients with uh, any severe psychological comorbidity that really should be seeing in-person care. Thank you. Yeah, great. Great to know about. Um, and I'm seeing no more questions in our Q&A, and we are at the, the top of the hour. So really, Beth, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you all for joining. I hope you found um, a lot of value in this session. I know I certainly did. Um, and we will be following up with the recording and the CEU certificate. So have a good evening or morning, wherever you're joining us from. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.